Upshot, Ulti World Disc Golf's podcast about the latest in the disc golf world. It is Tuesday, June 4th. Josh Mansfield is out this week. He's, uh, he's doing city council stuff. He's, he's, got a, he's got the budget meetings on Pocatello, serious stuff. But joining me, Charlie Eisenhood, today is Brian Earhart, who's become a familiar face on the show. Brian, great to have you back. How are you? I'm fantastic. We're sitting here in the woods in Oregon. BSF is this week at Milo. I mean, life life can't get too much better out here on the tour. All right, let me ask you something real quick, right off the top. Josh and I were talking in the Rapid Reacts on Sunday for subscribers that the ideal world would be to have the Portland Open be this four-round Elite Plus, all that, mm-hmm. two rounds of the best of Glendevere, okay, and two rounds at McIver and absorb Beaver State Fling into the mega Portland tournament. How do you feel? Mixed. I feel mixed. (laughs) I will say, I think you have 242 acres of these 100-plus foot tall Douglas firs out here at Glendevere. One course out there feels strange. Maybe if you did one course there, maybe the other course gets built out for the spectators to go play between rounds. Um, you could go crazy with the spectator experience there, but I, I don't know. I I want more rounds at Milo McIver. It would kill me if it was just two rounds at that course. But I, the last time we had Worlds in Portland was 2014. I yep. think if if there was a world's bid put in um and we could do 3 and 2, I think that would be brilliant and I think uh you could really jazz up the Glendevere property to be just the best spectator experience in disc golf for many reasons other than just putting a spectator course on on the other side of the property cuz East in my opinion is just so so good. It's it's some of the players favorite course that they play all season long. And it's just beautiful to watch on television i mean mm-hmm. there there are a few courses that are this pretty on yeah. tour yeah and that that stuff matters there there is a tree on that property that our drone guy clocked at like 150 feet that's wow. insane that is insane <laughs> that is insane um well we got a lot to get to today Portland Open, very interesting tournament. Uh, the second Elite Plus of the season after Waco. Gannon Burr dominates to win it in MPO. But even the bigger story in FPO, Paige Pierce wins for the first time in over a year. It's her 68th Elite or Major victory of her career. And her first, of course, since her pretty severe ankle injury last summer, over in Europe that uh, kept her out of PCS, kept her out of European Open. She didn't play again until the beginning of this season at the Chess.com Invitational. She hadn't gotten uh, inside 10th place until last or two weeks ago at OTB. And then she comes out here and she wins it. And Brian, I mean, it just feels like this opens up what this season could be in FPO after we've kind of settled into some expectations around it being, you know, Kristen and Evelina and, you know, maybe Missy in the player of the year conversation. I think it's going to make the majors really exciting. The fact that yes, Kristen's gone overseas. She didn't come back. Evelina has gone. And now Paige is starting to peak again. She's starting to get back to form. The speed is finally back. OTB gave us some glimpses of, of what she could do. I mean, she sends a lot of energy into the concrete. And when you're dealing with an ankle injury like that, you're always in that phase of how much can I really put into this foot? And then because of holding back, your discs are going to fly a little bit differently. You have to relearn your bag. But man, this last week at Glendevere, I'm thinking of the, the aggressive shot she threw on 17, going outside of the double gap or the double tree gap and and throwing a full flex distance line. That w- That's Paige Pierce that I know of. And I'm excited to see her play style, if she can really dial that in against Kristen's consistent play style at the world championships. That's just going to be fantastic. What do you think has made the difference for Paige these last couple of weeks? I mean, uh, with with risk of spoiling a little bit, uh, Mm. I got an interview in with Paige earlier. It's going to air in just a moment. We're going to talk with Paige for about 30 minutes. Um, 
she says she thinks she might be throwing further than before her injury because she's throwing flippier discs, basically. Mm-hmm. Is that really the story for you? Do you feel like the, the simply like the distance is back and that's what it's about for Paige? Or are you seeing other signs that are like her game has changed since the beginning of this season that's gotten her back to not just competitive, but like winning with a close to a thousand rated tournament? Yeah, I mean, when you watched her during the the stretch of time that she was dominating pretty much every tournament, it was a lot of 12 speeds, sometimes some 13 speeds coming out of the hand, throwing just the most aggressive possible line that you can throw, running every single putt that you could run. But then you have this injury and you saw her throwing a lot more hyzer flip. Every disc that she has designed for Discraft is understable by nature. And her play style is 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 changing a little bit. I, I wish Tech Disc existed, you know, a few years back when we could clock Paige's stats when she was throwing back then and see what they're like now because she's throwing clean right now. I mean, the disc is coming out of her hand with very little wobble, it seems like. All the lines are really intentional. And yeah, the, the new disc that she's designed to drive is a pretty stable distance driver. I feel like it's a an homage to what the surge used to be before the newer runs started to come out a little bit more stable. And it's an 11 speed to my understanding. So she's just throwing a control driver out there and maybe it's just the decision-making mixed with all that time throwing the putters when she was kind of hurting. Um, that's changed her. I mean, it's a similar thing to, to what happened to Simon. Right. Started to take a little off and all of a sudden the results followed. You know, it's interesting to think about because Paige back then was playing on courses that were generally designed for MPO players, not FPO. Yeah. Yep. And she had this distance advantage over the field that meant that she could just go try to jam flex lines with mm-hmm. super overstable stuff. And she was out driving everybody by 50 to 100 feet mm-hmm. and was able to get birdies on holes that were otherwise unreachable for the FPO field. But the entire design, like, world has changed for fpo yes and now they're playing courses where holes are reachable for everybody in many cases and i think it almost forces page to have to play a different style because she is going to have to hit more gaps and she's going to have to be a little bit more of a finesse player because the the course design demands that i think it's going to be great and i think page is ready for it she's always been a frisbee head like you give her a lid and and she can throw it on any any which way you want and i think it's just the decision making that's going to be refining for her over time as i think it is naturally for most professional players i think once you get good enough at the game that's the most important thing that separates the best players from the ones who have talent but never seem to make the cash um and and yeah i i think that's pretty much it for Paige. but there was a period of time when she was trying to find her bearings again where you could tell the timing was completely off because it felt like her feet were thinking one thing, but her upper body were thinking a different thing. You know, she's thrown so many aggressive, powerful lines in her, in her days playing that it's like your brain thinks that you should be throwing the disc on the angle that throws that line. But then your feet are like, "I, I can't move that fast. I can't give you that much power right now. So then that's where the shanks happen. You know, feet thinking hyzer, upper body thinks flat. I saw her do that a few times earlier in the season. And uh, whereas it probably should have came out with hyzer, released it flat, threw it into the woods on the right. And she did that a lot early on. But it feels like now the the feet and the arms are, are a little bit more synced up. And it was such a treat to watch this weekend. It was awesome. Yeah. yeah. So she beats out Holland Hanley by a pair of strokes. Hanley goes crazy in the final round she shoots an 11 under sets the course record but it wasn't quite enough uh page had a pretty sizable lead coming in on 18 she was up by four strokes she ended up taking a double bogey but it didn't really matter um and then sophia donica who is a brand new face on the pro tour finishes in third she led the tournament after two rounds after setting the course record over at glendivere west um what amazing story this is. And I mean, she's she's two years into playing, Brian, and she's throwing 400 plus and she wanted to cash this weekend and instead she finished on the podium. She is a treat to, to speak with. Um, 
And and we can't say that she's only been playing for two years. I mean, competitively, she yes, she joined in 2022. This is her second Disc Golf Pro Tour event. We're not going to take that away from her. She did start during COVID. She started during COVID just like, you know, Ella, Holland, a few other really solid players. And she started playing on tone pole courses in Victoria, BC on an island and didn't even have chains to putt at, which to me is just awesome. Just an homage <laughs> to to where our sport has come um, and where it came from. But uh, how do I say this? The way she speaks is it's like when you take beginner's luck, like the concept of beginner's luck, and then you bottle it and, and, and give it to somebody, it's like the perfect formula. Like her expectations were so low. She shot 10 down at the West course and was like, yeah, you know, I went in and I thought even was going to be a great score for me. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the mindset. You're not afraid. You're just going in there saying, okay, I think I could do this. But then it lets the physical ability shine. And then on the other side of the coin, it's like when you listen to Gannon say, I better not choke this one away. Ah, my putt feels terrible. And then ding, 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 he wins the tournament by eight strokes. So it's definitely a quantifiable thing, but but it's it's not a coincidence that she did what she did this weekend. Everything was primed for, for what she did. Can she keep doing this? I mean, she's, she's going to be in the decision-making process right now, especially if it goes well again this weekend at Beaver State. Where like wait maybe I should like put a pause on my serious academic career or like figure out a more flexible option and go on tour because like I'm good enough to mm-hmm. not just cash but to like be a real player out here. Like, do you think she should do that or is it like maybe dip your toes a few more times? You know, I don't know. <laughs> I wish I knew more about what a a gap in employment does for like the job market and like a traditional job, especially for what she does. But I feel like any company, you and I are not the people to ask about. No, (laughs) no, I I'm disc golf until I'm dead and in the ground. So, uh, I'm not really good, good, good to speak on that, but I feel like if I'm a disc golf manufacturer and I have someone who is kind, well-spoken Harvard grad, like brilliant, and super talented and motivated clearly with her athletic background, it shows that like she knows what it takes to be an elite athlete. I feel like she's going to be getting offers soon. She has to, but how good is that offer in this day and age in disc golf? Cause I know a lot of those, those deals for players who are not superstars are they're average. They're kind of going back to what they were when I started touring, like a monthly salary is a pretty incredible thing to get if you were touring in in 2018. Um, But I think for her, she did this tour to see what it was like. She got third and played awesome. And sounds like she's having a great time and is going to play a few more events. But it sounded like when she was speaking about her performance this weekend, that it was the putting that surprised her. So when you ask if she can do this again, we'll just have to see how the putt does over time. The stroke looks beautiful. It comes out of her hand with a lot of intention, a lot of spin. There's barely any wobble when it comes out of her hand, so she'll putt in the wind fine. But that's the thing that we need to see week in and week out. The disc pops out of her hand. I was telling people she she reminds me of like if you took Erica Stinchcomb and Ella Hansen and like combined the two together, that's kind of what her backhand looks like to me just by the way they move. But it comes out fast. Like she has the intangibles right there that you can't really teach somebody. So I, overall, I think she could be extremely successful. Well, it's certainly going to be really interesting. We're going to hear from Sophia on Thursday's show. Um, got a little interview done with her earlier today. And uh, right now, though, I'm going to send us over to our interview with Paige Pierce who's got a lot to say about what this win means to her, how this changes her outlook moving forward this season, uh, more on the recovery timeline and just the astronomical cost of her ankle repair and this time getting back to being able to play competitive disc golf uh, and more. So stay with us. Paige Pierce joins us next right here on The Upshot. The Upshot is presented by Pound Disc Golf, makers of the best bags in the sport. 
The custom toolbox builder is coming to a close. They announced that earlier this week. People must place orders for custom toolboxes before June 30th when the custom toolbox builder will be discontinued. So get yourself a toolbox. It's a great little bag. You can use it as a practice bag. For a long time, it was my actual disc golf bag. Great size, fits in your trunk, super nice. You can get it exactly customized to your specs, but you only have another month to do that. So head over to pounddiscgolf.com, check out all the options, the custom toolbox builder, and come out and see them this weekend at the Portland Open. Joining us now on the Upshot is your 2024 Portland Open champion, Paige Pierce. Paige, we just had you on the show, coming back from the injury, and it hasn't really taken you very long to get back in the winner's circle. It must feel like quite an accomplishment after what you've gone through the last, you know, almost a year at this point. Yeah, definitely. Um, Yeah, it feels like a long time, but like tournament-wise, I really haven't played that many since... Uh, my injury. So yeah, it's, it's kind of both like where it feels like, wow, I've come a long way. And also like, whoa, like if this is what I can do this far along, like hopefully I can just keep pushing forward. Yeah. Where, where would you say that your game is right now? I mean, this was your first, I was just looking at the ratings and stuff. This is your first 990 plus tournament uh since last year's OTB Open which was also your last win on tour um so you know does it feel like you're back to where you were or is it still a, like a, a lot of work to do in your mind um i think that my drives are back to where i used to be um but and i wouldn't say that my putting's not but this weekend in particular at the Portland Open I didn't putt as well as I have been, even just that OTB last, the last event and earlier in the season, like my putting was saving me. And this weekend, I think my putting almost could have cost me the tournament, but luckily my drives were back, back better than ever. So, um, honestly debating if I'm throwing even farther than I was before, but it feels like I am, but I'm not positive of that. What, why do you think that is? Uh, I don't know. I think I got my distance back for sure. Just in, in how I got that back is just like my timing, getting the stability and, and, uh, being able to like fully put my weight behind it with trust again. Um, that was a big part of it. And, you know, I had to change kind of like my timing in the way that my run up was because of my ankle. And so now I'm back to my normal run up and everything. Um, but now I have a, my newest driver, the drive. It's uh, I'm not throwing as stable of discs. So um, like before, my my main driver was a Zeus, which is like kind of like a destroyer type where it's like really overstable, and I had to like torque it over to like get the full flight. And with this new driver, I'm I'm uh, actually during my like recovery. Back when I first started throwing discs again. Uh, I was like only able to throw like seven speeds and lower. Um, I just like, I would try to throw like a 10 speed and it would just like stable out and go nowhere. So um, I wanted to make it like a flippier disc. And so now like learning, building up to this and learning how to throw a little bit more neutral flying discs, like I'm able to like pop it on a hyzer and flip it up to flat and glide. And I'm just getting more distance out of the discs um, because of that, I think. So that definitely helps as well. And it keeps me more, I'm not really like going left or right too much. I'm able to use the center of the fairway. So, um, I'm feeling more accurate at hitting gaps as well. It's, uh, I mean, it, you know, we said it in the rapid reacts like this, your win here kind of changes the complexion of the season a little bit because I mean, I'm actually curious to get your response to this. I mean, a lot of people online have been talking about you like you're never going to win again, like you were just completely toast, and this is the end of you know you as a as a top level competitive player. Um, and obviously, that was extremely premature. Like, d- did you see that stuff, and, and, and d- has that affected you at all? Uh, I don't look at that. I have a social media manager and I just (laughs) would prefer to not look at any of that stuff because these people don't know me. They don't know what 
what I'm made out of or like what my goals are or, or how my body feels or anything. So, um, haters going to hate, right? <laughs> yeah. D- does it, does this win change your mindset about what's possible for you this year? Like, are definitely. you starting to look at majors and be like, yeah, I'm coming? Yeah, definitely. I, I, I want, you know, it's funny cause like your mindset just changes. Like when I first was starting to throw again, um, I was playing every day. I was like stoked to like, you know, sometimes it's like, Oh, I better go practice. But like, I was like, Ooh, let's go, you know, first thing in the morning, grab my coffee, get out the door, go practice and like doing PT. And I was just like amped on it. And, uh, <clears throat> my sidearm was good uh, getting better and better because for a while I could only putt or do sidearm because I couldn't like twist my ankle at all still, even though, even when I was able to walk. Um, so I was like, okay, I'm getting better. My putting's getting better. My sidearm's getting better. Like, and I was just feeling like amped up and like, I'm going to win a major. Like, cause last year, uh, 2023 was my first year in my career, that professional career that I haven't won a major. And so that was my first goal. Like, okay, I'm going to come back. I'm going to win a major. And blah, blah, blah. And I, I was like, I'm going to win a lot of tournaments. I'm not just going to win one and like, be like, Oh, paid one, a tournament. It's like, I'm going to win a lot. And like, I'm going to be the person to beat. And then, you know, three events later, I go play three events and I'm like, Oh, well, reality check. Like, (laughs) I guess I'm not like, it's not as fine tuned as I thought. And I was throwing some incredible shots, but I was just like, really inconsistent. Like I would throw the best shot I'd like that I had visibly seen myself throw in the last year. But then like two holes later, I would hit first available and knock it up and down. So, um, yeah, like your, your game, but also your mental state like fluctuates a lot. So, um, the past couple, I don't know, time, I don't know time, but like for the recent past, um, I've been feeling like, all right, this is going to take longer than I thought. All right. Um, but you know, just stay patient, just keep pushing. And then at OTB, um, getting fifth, I felt like I was returning to form and I actually like had a catch session. This it's funny that playing catch has been my, uh, like my, uh, I don't know, like my base of like how, recovered I am or not. Um, but like catch has always been one of my favorite activities. I think I've told you that before, but Mm -hmm. when the disc is flying to me, you just like, it doesn't matter if the person throwing it shanked it, you kind of like run over there and grab it. And that's part of the fun. Well, I haven't really been able to play catch unless like someone throws it right to me. Um, cause I can't like do the fast like motions and running over. Um, but actually at OTB, I had two different catch sessions where, I was completely unaware of even which ankle was broken. Um, and I was like actually sprinting. And then, uh, the next day after the catch session, like I woke up and I, I like just decided to try to like sprint and like see how it felt. And I was like jumping with joy, just like that. I was back able to run again. Cause I've been able to like do a small little jog or do jumping things, but like to run, I haven't been able to do that. So that was like a big, big, big confidence booster of like, wow, even though it's hard to measure day by day, what's getting better. Like this is something I couldn't do even just two weeks ago and now I can. So like it was a, it was a really big confidence booster that, okay, my body is still getting better. And like now I'm, able to do everything I was able to do before. And I think that that confidence going into Portland, like mentally nothing was holding me back and, and, and physically as well. So, um, definitely. So you're going back to Europe in, in the month, basically. Uh, are you, does do you have any like hesitation about it because that's where you got hurt last year? Um, the only thing I changed was I booked the insurance for the flight, you know, like when it's like, <laughs> do you want to protect your trip? I insurance. never hit. Yes. I never hit. Yes. And I wish I would have done that. Cause like on top of the astronomical, like, uh, financial strain of like the surgeries and all that, uh, 
the trip there, because I also had my wife with me. So like we had two trips that we had to now, we didn't get the money back and we had to buy mm. new flights. Mm. Uh, so yeah, that w- that costs quite a few thousand dollars there. So I was like, yes, protect my trip. <laughs> but And now I do that every time I fly, just because you never know what's going to happen. Um, but that's the only hesitation, like going back there. I'm actually really excited. I'm, I'm uh, going to go to... Uh, Vestness and the course that it happened on and uh, go see those people because I I really do want to just like I I really enjoyed my time there Uh, and like I I know how bad they felt and like I never even got to finish the course like it happened on hole seven on my practice round so like I want to go play the course and and say hello and goodbye to them and like just my appreciation and I I told my wife too like I kind of just want to go like sit on that bridge and like make peace with it and just like, you know, move past it. And, uh, so we're actually going to Norway as well before, uh, the European open. Cool. Uh, you mentioned the travel insurance stuff. Does the turn, did the tournament cover any of your medical bills because this was an injury sustained as a part of like competition? I mean, I know it wasn't actively competition yet. And so maybe that's a wrinkle that matters, but the PDGA has event insurance for this kind of thing. Um, so how, did that come into play for you at all? Yeah, yeah, it did. It was a long process. Like my, my surgery was July 25th um, and they needed payment by the day before. Otherwise we were going to have to reschedule surgery. And the surgery cost was $78,100. Oh my God. Yeah. Um, and that's just for the surgery. That's not like all the x-rays and all the other doctor's visits and PT and all that. But, uh, so anyway, uh, they needed $78,000 and I feel very fortunate that I was in a financial situation where I was able to do that. Um, and I don't really spend money on things like food and, and experiences, but like, I don't have a fancy car or like, you know, I don't like the last time I bought a new shirt, I can't even tell you. So like I, (laughs) I felt like really fortunate that we were able to cover that. But then like the reality hit of like, whoa, there's like all of our savings are gone. And now I'm like out of a job. So like, right. Not only is it like, Oh, here's this one big expense, but like, we'll be able to make it up in a short period of time or whatever. Like I was out of work. I didn't know when I would be back to work, anything like that. And it was a weird thing with the insurance because I didn't like blame anyone. So I wasn't like, Hey, I'm going to sue you. You better give me this money or anything. But I did just reach out to the PDJ and, and say like, Hey, like it was a practice round, blah, blah, blah. And they were, the PDJ was awesome. Actually. Like I had two different people calling me and like making sure I had everything I needed. Cause using their insurance, like I'm not talking to the PDJ, I'm talking to the PDJ to the insurance, insurance people. Yeah. Right. So, but the, the PDJ still reached out and like was making sure I had everything I needed and stuff. But, um, yeah, it did cover it because it was an official practice day, which is 48 hours before the tournament or whatever. So it did cover it. Unfortunately though, like the, their policy limit was $25,000. So I did get reimbursed $25,000, not till like January. So I was still out 78 grand, like for a long time, but they reimbursed me 25,000, but you know, still only like a third of the cost, less than a third of the cost. So, um, that's actually something I I'm talking with my agent and my lawyer about just like you know, getting with the PDJ and, and hoping like, I don't want any more money back. It would be nice to have my bills like at least break even, you know, but it's more about like the future, like there, like an ankle is minuscule, you know, like what happens if, I don't know, someone breaks their back and like is paralyzed or something like that medical bill, who knows how much that's going to be and like 25,000 is nothing. So trying to like, you know, work and like show them like, Hey, we need a better insurance policy. Um, which this is the first I'm talking about this publicly, but, um, yeah, yeah, we're, we're discussing that and like going to go to the PDJ and I, I hope they're receptive and I think they will be. How do you, how do disc golfers who are, you know, not employed by 
They're sponsors. They're not employed by the Pro Tour. They're basically independent contractors. And getting health insurance can be challenging, expensive if you're not getting it through your job. Yeah. Um, so like, what is the plan? Or I mean, I think the Pro Tour has to think about this too because, you know, they don't want you... I mean, you know, you you may, as you mentioned, you're in a fortunate position to be able to front $78,000. I mean, a, a mid-tier pro on tour is not going to yeah. have that money. So then yeah. what? Like, go fund me? I mean, obviously, people can get insurance through the marketplace online, but I, yeah. I do think it's uh, interesting to think about, like, what what is the obligation of the PDGA and or the Pro Tour to its athletes at these top-level events when yeah. it comes to injury sustained on the course? Yeah, and, and to be clear, I do have health insurance. It, it was... Mm -hmm. uh, it was kind of a, like a funny coincidence thing because this is like the first time I've had health insurance in my adult life. I was like, you know, we should get health insurance. Like now we're financially stable, you know, like let's get health insurance. And, uh, I got, it happened in July, I probably got insurance in like March or something like that. Um, and so I did health have health insurance, but my policy only covered $80. They, they said, I was like, what do you mean? Cause I sent them like what happened, what? all that. Yeah. $80 of the surgery. And then PT, they didn't cover PG and they don't cover x-rays. And Is so it's just because it's like a, a bad insurance plan or like, how yeah, did that work out? Apparently I didn't. So this is the naive of me because I've never had health insurance. Um, make sure your plan covers surgical procedures. Yeah. Um, I just thought that why else would you have insurance? Like what else is there? I just, I didn't even <laughs> think to ask that question because yeah. I just thought, I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> so anyway, since obviously I've canceled that insurance and gotten new in insurance, that's much better. Um, but also much more expensive, but you know, it's like, yeah, it's just a crazy thing. And that's why the PDJs took so long because mine was the primary insurance. Mm -hmm. So it There's was a like whole months paperwork of, process. Yeah, I probably spent thirty plus hours on the phone, you know, Ugh. with mine, and then it's like, okay, we we'll, let's do secondary insurance, and then it's like, that's the PDJ. Oh, and every time I got on the phone with a new person, I had to explain, no, the primary, this is the secondary, do, 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 do. and also since I paid it up front, it was like this reimbursement thing, and it, anyway, it was a whole ordeal, but um. Yeah, I, I think that it's it's a tricky spot from what I've been told anyway. I haven't done my own research, but um, with the PDJ or the Pro Tour or even a, our sponsors doing insurance for us, um, we're not technically employees. We're like we right. do contract work, so it's hard right. to get insurance for a contract worker. So I don't know how to remedy that. I know like in the NFL and stuff, they, they're in a union and they get insurance through the union and they pay their dues to that. So, I mean, that would be ideal situation is that we create a, a union and like we have some sort of, and then, then we have insurance. So we have lawyers, we have a place that can say if we disagree with something like, you know, anything like that. So I think that's probably the next step. And I think it's definitely, definitely needed long overdue i would say yeah wow i mean it's a ongoing thing but i mean i i guess thank goodness you're able to get it done and you're back and now you got a chance to go try to win a major out in europe a place where you've had a lot of success in the past uh what's your confidence level going back into that tournament you know i know you missed it last year because of the injury Kristen was unbelievable last year yeah. in the european open she blew everybody away yeah. Um, what's it going to take to beat her and take down a, a major this year? Yeah. Um, I think that honestly, like I think Kristen for sure. I think henna, I think Evelina, I think we all have games that suit that course at the beast really well. It's pretty, pretty open, um, and long distance shots. I think, uh, we all have a pretty good chance just going into that course, but don't we play Tampere also? Yeah. Yes. It's so world's, this is, world's preview for yeah, next year. Yeah, that's what I thought. So this year playing both of those, it's going to change things dramatically. So I feel like for me, my game plan is just to be super aggressive on the beast 
and try to get some strokes um, before we head to Tampere because that one is very tight, very, very tight. And um, yeah, that one, I probably will stay like, you know, hitting, hitting shots hard, but clubbing down to like my putter and just making sure to get through the gap and maybe playing for par on some of the tighter holes. But, um, you know, I'm excited to get out there and, and figure out that game plan. Um, but yeah, the beast, I have so many memories. I've been playing there for so long and, um, yeah, I'm excited to get back there. It was really hard watching that one from home when I was supposed to be there. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, I had my Airbnb booked, I had my flight, I had all of it. And, uh, you know, sitting at home, like throwing up every two seconds because of the anesthesia wearing off and like, you know, watching, it was just like so sad and. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It's one of my favorite places to play. And, uh, yeah, it's just, I'm looking forward to it. And, and I do feel, I think, what was your question? What's your confidence level? Yeah. Um, Okay. Uh, sorry. (laughs) Yeah, I feel, I feel confident. I feel, um, a little bit, uh, unsure about Tampere, but just because I've only played there like twice. So I'm like trying to remember the holes, but you know, I'm a pro and I've played a lot of courses and, like it's, it's not something where only playing it twice is going to really affect me. I just need to make sure I get enough practice time and set up a good game plan. But as far as the beast, my confidence level is pretty high. You're not playing the Beaver State Fling this weekend. Uh, do you wish you were <laughs> since you're coming off the win? No, definitely not. Especially because I'm coming off the win because like now I actually have time to like enjoy the win and not <laughs> like otherwise it's already like practice time like it's crunch time for them like and so like to not have that uh okay put this big monumental win for myself behind me and move forward to this next tournament like it's nice to just be able to sit in that and like keep like flashing back to certain shots I threw and like yeah that was awesome like I really like overcame some like mental thoughts on that one and like yeah so I I especially because of the win, I, I'm excited that I'm not playing. But I think it, for me, it's like, I, I didn't know I was going to win. So I made, I made those plans before I won. So like, for me, it, it's just like, I want, I love Milo. I love that course, but it's just, I have to be a little bit more choosy, especially when I want my career to be long. I don't want to play every tournament and like, I want to make sure my body and my mind are fresh. Like, and so every time I go to a tournament, I feel a hundred percent committed and a hundred percent like, uh, physically prepared as well. So, um, yeah, I'm actually going to am nationals this weekend in Michigan and doing like some clinics and like a, a challenge where like, if they beat my score, they get a, a new disc and, uh, yeah, so it'll be fun, like watching some players shred toboggan, getting a practice round before D Glow, which is also an elite plus. And uh, yeah, just hanging with the Discraft fam for a few days. Uh, you know, looking back at your schedule so far this year, you hadn't finished inside the top 10, or like you were 10th at chess.com, but then, you know, you yeah. didn't have a single digit finishing uh, result until OTB, where you finished fifth. Yeah. And then, of course, you win this weekend. What do you feel like changed the most? from kind of those earlier tournaments to these past two where like you clearly have come into form. I mean, you led, you led the tournament in circle one in regulation this weekend. You, you barely went out of bounds. Uh, a lot of things look like they were working except maybe circle two putting. Yeah. Um, honestly, just like my body getting, getting better. Like, and with that, my mind too, because like my doctor's telling me like, uh, I think it might've been like around March, he gave me the full green light on like, okay, now you're allowed to jump, you're allowed to twist, you're allowed to run. And, but allowed to, and feeling like feeling actually able to, and feeling confident in that are two different things. So, um, you know, being like feeling myself getting more and more confident with every step or like little jump or run, like I'm saying was a huge turning point. So like, once I really started like jumping again and pushing off, like my jump putt felt better and like, you know, pushing off that back foot. But then again, still in my head, sometimes I would be like, okay, don't push off too hard. And like my, that would change my entire timing and early release, late release, 
some good ones, but a lot of bad ones. Um, but like just feeling it being pain free and like over time, more and more and more shots, like not hurting my confidence is just getting better and better. Um, so it's just a, a patience thing a timing thing. And, you know, I'm still not like fully recovered con- uh, from my surgeon's perspective. He said a full year for recovery. Um, so that's also good for me to like keep in mind and like, okay, it's going to keep getting better. It's going to keep getting better, but it's funny. You don't have like this, like, you know, numerical like monitor that's like, okay, you're just 86% healed. You're 92% healed. Like, so you just kind of have to figure out your own limitations and, and like, you know, worst case scenario for me is re and like getting hurt again. So like yeah, right. pushing, but not pushing too hard. Uh, you came very close a couple years ago to getting to a thousand rated and becoming the first player to do that in, in FPO. Um, didn't quite get there. And now Kristen has eclipsed that, um, as of the most recent update. Are you disappointed that you didn't get there first? Um, not like first. Um, I'm disappointed that I got so close and then now it just plummeted. Um, that is what I'm disappointed about. Not that like it's a race or anything. I think that's still a goal of mine to like get a thousand rated. And now we can see that it's possible. So, um, that gives us all hope, not just myself. So, but I know now, like I have such a long way to go and it just, it just goes to show you like how consistently good of a player Kristen is, you know, like getting a shooting a thousand rated, like lots of people do that. Lots of people have done that. But like for Kristen, she's done it so often and she just like, she, she reminds me of like Val back in the day when I was competing against Val, like you have to play lights out to beat her. She's not going to mess up really, you know, and that's, that, that is Kristen to a T. Like she really doesn't mess up, you know, you have to beat her. So, um, I feel like she's obviously pushed the bar and shown us what's possible. And, um, yeah, I feel like I got a long way to go from, from there. But if you said something about 990 rated golf or something, so like that's, that's moving in the right direction for me. And, um, you know, just trying not to think about how long it's going to take and just trying to keep pushing and, and, uh, improving and, you know, hopefully, hopefully I do that. And hopefully with like taking these breaks and playing the tournaments that I really want to play, then, you know, I keep my body fresher for longer and I can, you know, who, who knows if that's five years down the road, but if I keep consistently rising up, then maybe that's still possible for me. Uh, Sophia Donicky led the tournament uh, for a time this weekend. I know you got a chance to play with her a little bit. What did you think of her game as she kind of made her DGP take debut just like two weeks ago? Yeah, I, I played with her at OTB Open as well. And, nice. Um, when I saw her name on my card, I was like, huh, I don't know. I don't think I know who that is. And then I saw the little Canadian flag and I was like, cool. Like, I've been playing with new players all the time lately, like, especially like being down at the bottom of the field, like, I'm meeting new people all the time and I'm like, wow, this girl like shot a hot round. We're on chase guard together at OTB suite and she killed it. And, you know, like seeing her just crush shots. I was like, this is awesome. But I didn't really realize that she was going to be on tour tour really. So I didn't know that I was going to see her at OTB uh, Portland as well. And then, you know, when I saw her name up there, I wasn't surprised at all, especially with, you know, how solid her game was at OTB and she was on chase card already at OTB. Um, but I was surprised when I talked to her more and more and realized like, she's only been playing for two years, really. Like, and <clears throat> she's kind of like one of the Calvin types. Like she's a, she's got her degree in chem engineering and stuff. Yeah. It's like, wow. Like, you know, she's very intelligent and like that shows in like her choices she's making too. And, but like, yeah, diselection and just like her pure, pure power is just like really, really impressive. All right. Well, you got a week off here. Um, your next tournament is is um, up Preserve. in Minnesota, yep. Preserve. How, how are you? Uh, are you looking forward to that? And uh, you know, kind of the last stop in the U.S. before you head over to Europe. Yeah, um, Preserve's one that I love as well. It's just like a really cool spot to be, and um, 
yeah, I, I definitely didn't want to miss that one. It also works out pretty well for me because I can drive my car to Illinois, leave it there, fly out of Illinois and get to Europe and then have my car there for when we get back. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I'm going to Amnats this weekend and then next week in the middle of the week, I'm going to Bonnaroo and I'm doing another clinic there. And last year we had like 750 people. So I'm hoping we'll get like around that or maybe even more this year. And, uh, then I go straight from there to preserve. And, uh, so yeah, the next, and then straight from preserve to Europe. So the next few weeks are going to be pretty crazy for me. So I'm kind of enjoying these like three days I leave for, um, Minnesota, uh, uh, sorry, Michigan on Thursday morning. So, um, I'm enjoying these two days at home that I get to just chill for a minute. And, uh, then yeah, really looking forward to preserve. And, you know, at that point it'll have been two weeks since I played my last tournament. So, um, I know already, already I'm thinking about the shots and like what discs I need to pack. Cause I'm kind of like packing for the, um, for my next little leg of, of travel. And so like, I'm already thinking about the shots and, uh, definitely I know when I get there, like after not playing for two weeks, I'll feel like really excited to play again. And like, uh, yeah, I'm just excited to, to be out there for sure. Awesome. Well, Paige, thanks so much. Congratulations once again on, uh, getting the win and, Looking forward to seeing you uh, at Preserve and then on to Europe. Thank you so much, Charlie. Thanks for having me. So it's not lying. My favorite podcast to be on. You, oh. ask, you ask the best questions. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> always, uh, always enjoy having you on. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. We'll be right back. Welcome back to The Upshot. Thanks again to Paige for making time. And Brian, I know you weren't there for the interview, but I know you know that Paige has got to be one of the best people to talk to in disc golf. The most honest interview maybe in all of the sport. It's definitely, she's a top five for sure. Definitely. She's, she's been, she's been around the block a few times and she's been interviewed a few times. So you, as an interviewer, you got to be on your game. You got to ask her questions that are engaging and, and entertaining um, but yeah, uh, I think she's finally getting really excited to come back and, and catch, I said a second wind, but it's more like a fourth, fifth, sixth wind with how long her career has been. But it's, it's awesome to see the emotion and how excited she is to just be throwing the disc. Well, again, I know when she got interviewed by Nate, she was like, I'm just happy to have my discs fly the way that I envisioned them to fly again. So the gratitude is definitely there. Do you think she's going to win a major this year that's her goal that's her goal and i hope she brings it i think it'll just be so exciting Kristen coming back from the injury i hope she's okay um i mean evelina is coming back and she's performing at the top level missy always shows up at this level holland has six podiums this year i don't know i think we're primed for a really exciting finish to the season with the playoffs and and uh, all the majors. So I think she could do it if she does what she did this weekend. And I'm interested to see how she plays at new London, which is brutal. It is true Northwood style woods. So we'll see how accurate she's thrown at that time of the season. That's going to be a, that's a real wild card. Yeah. A lot of players haven't played the course yet. It's hard. It's going to be, it's going to be really interesting. Yeah. Um, All right. Let's turn our attention over to MPO. Gannon Burr shot a, it wasn't a bad round at all in the final round, four under on a day when the hot round was a six. And he won the tournament by eight strokes. This is one of the largest margins of victory on the tour in a long time. uh, Tied for the largest of the last five years. And he had a 10-shot lead going into the final round. Brian, we do not, I almost called you Josh. We do not see... This level of dominance on tour anymore. Mm-hmm. It is extremely rare to go into a final round with somebody with more than like a three, maybe four shot lead. Yeah. And Gannon had 10. What in the world was in the water this weekend for him? Well, first off, crazy stat. The last person to have 10 strokes after three rounds of competition was Climo. At the 1999 US DGC. <laughs> crazy. That's crazy. That it, and really, all that, it, it's, it's three strokes around. 
it's right. And that's what's funny about these longer tournaments is like, you're not going to outplay somebody uh, by just throwing the flashier tee shot. It's those three little micro mistakes per round that will get you that big lead. And he did, did that 10 times. And I remember interviewing him and he said something along the lines of, uh, if, if I clean up all of the simple things, it'll be impossible for me to bogey. And he's focusing on all those little upshots, those 30 foot putts, all those little things that don't feel like big mistakes, but they do add up over the course of a four round tournament. And I thought he was brilliant. And when you talk to him, uh, normally he's like, oh, this was terrible. My putt was feeling as bad as it's ever felt, blah, blah, blah. You know, the mental gymnastics to kind of keep that low expectation beginner's mindset like we were talking about. But this week was definitely different. He he felt he felt like he was satisfied What by the way he was talking. Obviously, he's nitpicky about everything because he's obsessed with disc golf still. But um, I think we saw a Gannon playing the way that he wanted to play. And it wasn't like he did anything spectacular. Like the rounds he shot were very, very solid. It's so interesting because I feel like when Gannon really puts it together like this for a weekend, you kind of ask yourself, who could beat him? Like, who, who else is out there? I mean, obviously, we've seen Calvin's looked fantastic when he's been at 100% this mm-hmm. year. Barella was tremendous to start the year. We've seen other guys look really good. But I just, I still get the feeling when I see stuff like this, I'm like, Gannon is about to be the guy for the next decade. And there will be other people who get wins, of course, but I just don't know if I see other people playing at this level it's really it's it feels like the putting is the separator but he has every facet of the mm-hmm. game unlocked when he is at his best in a way that i don't yeah. know that other guys on tour do right now i would say yeah i mean i i've been saying that gannon is the best player um in the world for a while now i think there was a time when i think ab had the momentum and had him beat And the tour points showed that. But when you're talking about just unlocking different skill sets and making them stock skill sets, he has everything now. I think for a time, Perkins and I were were looking really closely at how comfortable the Heiser flip looked like for him. And at first it looked just awkward and not good. And it looked like his whole soul wanted to be throwing a flex shot and kind of following through out of his shoes like he's used to. But he has just gotten so much better at like hitting the brace, jamming his hips, throwing the hyzer flip, letting the disc do the work. And he was throwing it as fluid as his flex shots. And the coolest part is he was like changing his posture on the fly and he was dancing back and forth between the two play styles easily. And you take it for granted. You're like, oh yeah, all these guys should be able to throw a hyzer flip and a flex. And it's like, not, not really. Like you pay attention on tour and there's weaknesses for all of these guys. Um, When Paul is throwing Heiser really well, Paul's throwing flex terribly. And he's mentioned it in multiple interviews. Ricky has just started throwing Heiser flips after a decade plus of playing well. So Gannon's got the head start. And I I can't even imagine where he's going to be in five years in regards to how he approaches the game. I predict that he's going to change change the way the game is played, like Steph Curry did in the NBA. I think we're going to see kids using him as the benchmark for, for quite some time. Do you mean that in the sense that his completeness of game is something that the kids are going to start to follow as well? Because it feels like for a long time, players kind of figured out what worked for them, and then they just sort of stuck with that. Mm-hmm. And that meant that you know there were forehand-only players or backhand-only players. I mean there are those players on tour right now um and some of them very successful but it does feel like you're starting to become at a fairly obvious disadvantage especially as course design has stopped favoring righty backhand as much as it did in the past Mm -hmm. um and so you have to be able to throw both spins but like what specifically i guess about gannon do you feel like is going to change the way things are relative to what other young players are doing as well. So I have to go back to Paul first, because I think Paul truly did that first. 
Um, because I, I'm not going to take away how good his forehand is still. I mean, he's still one of the best forehand throwers in disc golf. And then when he was playing at his best, you know, the backhand had everything too. He was able to do anything he wanted with the backhand. But weird, weirdly enough, it feels like Gannon has taken that and then ran with it even farther. Like he has... He has that crazy, like nose down, power flex shot style that Ricky throws as his stock shot. And then now he's learning these like little nose up, spinny, hyzer flip shots. He can play the wind and throw the flip up distance shot. He can throw a PD2 and a hard nose down flex and get the distance line. It's just even closer to whatever that situation calls for. I have the optimal throw for it. And it's actually a throw that I'm confident in. And I, you know, I still think Paul has, has some weaknesses too. Um, and I just think Gannon's improving upon what him and Ricky set, uh, the bar for, for quite some time. And now he has the, the awesome forehand too. Like his forehand has developed into a deadly weapon. I mean, I, he doesn't need to be throwing Heiser flip forehands. There's not too much of a, of a need for that, but his forehand is unbelievable. I mean, he has plenty of distance. He has great control over the flex. He can throw all sorts of speeds of disc with it. And then he has this putt that, again, feels like a blend of Ricky and Paul's putt. It's like this spinny, nose-down dagger putt that can go up to 100 feet without having to jump. I don't know. I just think he's improved upon everything. In in the world of chess, he reminds me of Magnus Carlsen, where, where people are like, I, I can't play against this guy. He has an answer for everything. He's completely universal. He's, he's mastered everything. So are there things that I, I, Gannon can improve on? Sure. But man, has he improved on his weaknesses and, and is getting close to that fully universal play style. Do you think it's a coincidence that he won both of the four round elite pluses this season? A coincidence. Hmm. I mean, I guess no. what I'm saying implicitly is that more rounds, cream rises to the top. It's why we see world champ. It's why world the world championship is considered the most prestigious mm-hmm. tournament to win. Yeah. So, like, is it the fact that like his skill is able to shine through with more rounds to show it off? Yeah, I don't think it's a coincidence. Uh, even before he overtook AB in in the tour points, he had a better average finish than Anthony. So he he was finishing higher up and not finishing uh, lower down the leaderboard better than AB was even when he was winning. So um, I think Gannon, if he brings his best to the table at the majors, should have no problem taking his first world title down this year because of how much better he's gotten playing in the woods. I think whatever golf course they throw at him in Virginia, he's going to just absolutely annihilate it. And in the woods, I feel like he has just become such a threat, whereas before I, I... wasn't thinking that he was. What do you make of the fact that he finished 10th at Champions Cup at Northwood? Uh, that was just an insane week in general. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was. It, it was. And I I think that had a lot more to do with just mental fortitude than anything. And also, we played four rounds at Northwood Black, where a lot of things can happen. So I actually applaud him for getting 10th place at Northwood's. Um, if it was, you know, two rounds, Northwoods, two rounds, Eureka, he might've done better. Um, Mm -hmm. he's a USDGC champion. He knows how to play on these placement style courses. Um, that's why I feel like he did so well at Glendivere. That's kind of his dream style of golf. It's like park style, big trees, big gaps, but not like long corridors like Nevin, things like that. Um, so I don't know. I, I think... Woods style, he still needs to get a little bit better at. Like, I don't, I wouldn't call him like top five Woods players on tour, but I, I think he could. I think over time he could. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he clearly has the tools to get there. He's nineteen. That's crazy. It's crazy to imagine that he's only nineteen. I mean, he how could much just winning become, he's already done. He he could literally become. I mean, I'm not going to say Michael Johansson. I'll, I'll go to somebody else. Michael Johansson's a, a beast of his own. Um, but he he could be as proficient in, in playing in the woods as like a Dickerson in the next five years. Easily. Because he already has the stable game figured out. He has the windy yeah. Midwestern, you know, placement golf figured out. So I, I don't know. I, I'm... 
and maybe that's what I'm saying in regards to changing the way the game is played. We forget that he's 19. We forget <laughs> that in six years when he's 25, where they say that's your athletic prime, the, the game is going to be in a completely different place, largely because of him and maybe a few other guys his age. What do you make of Anthony Barella the last few weeks? We saw him obviously come out so fantastic at the beginning of the year, but he's slowly been finishing kind of worse and worse at tournaments. Um, a kind of a, a particularly bad final round, eight over in the rainy conditions on Sunday, left him in 44th. Um, and so is, is, is something off? Is there a timing problem? What's going on? Really didn't get to watch him play a lot this last yeah, weekend. It's, it's fair. Um, it's fair. But players are allowed to be burnt out. And it's been a lot of golf. And he won three tournaments really early. And it felt like I started to talk to him like every single day. And, <laughs> you know, we were putting together these packages of, oh, the big four are coming for you. AB and Gannon and Nick Loss and Kyle Klein, they're coming for you. And, and, uh, I don't know, he got a lot of, a lot of attention real early and, you know, he, he's not going to tell you straight up that he's feeling burnt out because he's, he's cool, calm and collected AB, but that, that literally could be all it is. And, and I, uh, I know this firsthand because it's hard to play a full season of disc golf and act like you, you have the intensity each and every week. Are these courses that I thought he was going to win on? Yeah, absolutely, 100%. But I don't know. Uh, what, what did he finish? What, what, what position did he finish in? I didn't even look. 44th. Tough final day. Yeah, maybe he checked yeah. out. <laughs> maybe he saw the forecast and said, eh, I'm not going to win. I'm checked out. Yeah, it, it, was not, it was not his finest work in the final round, that's for sure. He opened up with four straight bogeys and a double bogey. Holes one through five with uh, five out of bounds shots. So, oops. Oops. <laughs> At Pretty that much point, it. Whatever. That's all I have. I, I, I don't know. I, and, and you're not going to know. It's kind of like a Calvin character. You know, I was shocked that he even told us he was feeling injured. Um, there's just some players that don't want any of that out there. And that's mm -hmm. totally fine. You know, uh, I think a lot of players are learning. <laughs> If you if you tell someone that you're injured or you're burnt out or something, it's going to be constant check ins uh, on the media side. So, so we'll <laughs> every <see>. press conference, <laughs> every and, yeah, and you'll be at every single one of them, and I'll right. ask you the same question every week. So yeah, that's right. Um, Cole Rodolin finishes in second place. He's starting to come back into form in his home state of Oregon. Uh, Twenty five under. I mean, obviously he was eight shots back of Gannon, but Gannon played in another level from everybody else. Yeah. It was like Gannon up here. And then the rest of the field was playing like a second tournament to see who could win that mini version of the tournament. Um, and it was Cole who got that win. Uh, you know, we, we obviously saw some great stuff from Cole last year. It's been a little bit of a slow start for him in 2024, mm -hmm. but this is certainly encouraging. It's awesome. He made, he made a, a swing change this, this season. He wanted to, uh, engage his off arm a little bit better, which looks fantastic. Now he wanted to, you know, kind of compress his form a little bit, keep most of the distance, but improve the accuracy. I think he's doing that. Um, and I think it's just a long, long form change that he's going through. And I'm guessing that his, his shots are not as precise because of that, but he is such a pro to talk to. And he's so young and, Anytime you know you do an interview with him, it feels like he's been media trained. Like he's so well spoken and emotionally intelligent. I'm, I'm pretty impressed by him overall. But this weekend, he was just charged up by the fans. He loved putting a show on for the Portland fan. Every single time he hit a circle two putt, he looked back and he was like making sure the people knew that he he saw them. <laughs> and uh, he, he almost got emotional going into the final day because he was so happy he got that eagle on 18 to put him up to the lead card. He was so excited to play in front of the hometown crowd. And he knew that no matter what the weather is, they were going to show up. And of course they did because it's Portland. Yeah, I, I, Portland needs another Worlds. I would love it. I would oh, love man. it. That would be so awesome. Like, you know, two, three years from now, like... What so the first, last one was twenty fourteen? You do like a fifteen years later thing, even that'd be fine. That'd be awesome. I, I I think there's there's a real opportunity, and I feel like the people would come out huge. I mean, of course, I honestly wonder if the pro tour is going to reconsider 
the lack of uh, Western tournaments on the schedule because they play OTB, they play the two to- uh, tournaments up in Oregon, and then peace, we're out of here. Um, and the best crowds of the season have been OTB in Portland. What I've heard, and uh, I, I can't place this on specific places because I, I don't know the details and I don't want to botch it, but cell signal is is a real problem um, for a lot of these awesome places. And it's so sad, but also infrastructure comes first. I remember interviewing Sam Gaddis, yeah. who's you know the one of the big media operations guys for the Disc Golf Network. I interviewed him at the U.S. Women's, and he... He laughed when I asked him about winning the lottery and putting that lottery money towards something for the the network. And he's like, I don't care. Nothing else matters to me except for cell signal. We need more (laughs) cell signal. We need to make more of these places viable. It sounds like there are some spots, Wes, that are just unbelievable and would be great locations for the tour, but we wouldn't be able to broadcast it live to anybody. And I think those basically makes it a non-starter. And those satellite trucks are like what, like sixty grand or something like that for like a weekend of golf or something crazy like that. So I I don't know, but I think that's the sad part. And the other thing with like mountain golf, like Blue Mountain, we we played um, the Zoo Town Open there last year, and the, the infrastructure just wasn't there for for the broadcast, um, and and for parking and for all these other things. So yep, it's sad, but. I'm hoping that one day we have a whole tour of Olympuses in Maple Hills. That's just uh, <laughs> that's what I'm hoping for. Here's here's my pitch, and I somebody somebody from like the Utah area actually like clipped a earlier podcast of us talking about this a week or two ago. Salt Lake City, you've got a bunch of mountains that are within stone's throw of downtown. Yeah, and I have personally skied these mountains and made phone calls from the lift and had excellent cell signal because you're just literally up at the top of the mountain range. It looks over the city. Mm -hmm. So the towers are pointing right at you and they have, I mean, these are big ski mountains, icon pass, epic pass mountains. They have tons of infrastructure, food, drink, parking lots, all that. And it's, it's like close to the city. Park city is like 20 minutes from the airport. Now, I do not know whether any of these places have a legitimately championship level disc golf course, but if they don't build one, like these, these mountains are absolutely looking for things for summertime Mm -hmm. because of course they make 95% of their revenue in the winter as a ski mountain, Mm. but Salt Lake city is the answer because the problem with Colorado is that all those mountains are hell way the hell far from denver i mean there are some close by but it, it's not a, it's not a great fit but salt lake is the complete opposite and i promise you the the disc sports community there would come out strong and i know josh mansfield personally would go so oh he would <laughs> that's brilliant that's great uh, listen i want mountain golf more than anything i think it is so cool and i think you know, one time on the tour, showcase the beauty of that part of the country. I think yep. that's one of the beautiful parts about disc golf. And that's why I think a lot of people are sad when we play on most traditional golf courses, because you lose that idiosyncrasy about like where you are in the country. I feel like Glendevere is an exception because of the Douglas firs. Um, sure. It really, it, it, it evokes Portland. Exactly. So it Pacific evokes Northwest. Exactly. So I think we should do that. And I love that idea. Yeah. You know what? I, I'm going to just say this now. If anyone from the disc golf pro tour, hears this idea from Charlie uh, and you're monitoring what I say, I'm going to say this to you. I will design that course. <laughs> I will design the mountain course in Utah on my own dime and we will make it happen. Let's go. Sounds Let's go. awesome. I'm I love Salt up. Lake City. Someone's going to hit you up. I'm, I'm down. <laughs> I am so down. That would be amazing. It would be awesome. It would be I awesome. love Salt Lake. The, I've, and the fourth. There's, there's, like, there's, there's great courses in Utah, but it just yeah. depends on who wants to run the event. Local organizing and committee means a lot. I wonder, would one of the ski pass companies want to sponsor the tour? Do they, <laughs> do they have operation staff too? Do they have local people there to help build it out? That's the other thing. It's like our operations team is not a million people. It's very small. And 
we we need people year round out there working on that. So that's the other piece of the puzzle that I don't think some people realize. The local organizing committee is extremely important to putting these events on. Sure, sure. Well, I I I know there's people in Utah who would step up for that. I mean, you got such a you got industry there too with Infinite and everything. So uh, it it can happen. I I I can see I can see it. You know, three four years from now, it would, it would be awesome. Um, all right, Brian, what else stands out to you from uh, Portland Open this weekend? I mean, you, you watch the tour closer than probably anybody. Uh, you're doing Tournament Central pre and post every day, so you're having to go deep into these topics. Uh, and maybe not even necessarily specifically Portland. Mm-hmm. What are you just feeling right now at this point in the season that's kind of like noticeable to you uh, that we haven't already discussed? Man, we, we discuss so much on Tournament Central, and, and I'm so excited that for the direction of the show, too, because they're giving me and Perkins a lot of freedom to start building it out how we want. Uh, but but there were so many good things to talk about, uh, about Paige, but we said them. Sophia, awesome story. We said them. I think Gannon's mindset's always funny to talk about, how he kind of jumped through these loops to keep himself humble, and uh, we've talked about that. The one thing that I want to talk about right now, Charlie, is from the new Tectus segment that we did. We, we were finally partnered with Tectus for Tournament Central. One time a weekend, we get some throwing stats from a, from a player on a feature card. And something okay. that blew me away, and a- any form, form geeks out there that want to do some analysis on this, um, Calvin Heimberg throws 75 miles an hour. And has one of the lower spin rates of guys throwing that speed. I actually think he has the lowest spin rate of the guys throwing in the 70 mile an hour range. Um, At least of people that I've tracked. He is in the 1200s to low 1300 range for RPM. Most guys, including myself, are throwing 1400 to 1500. And then some of the real spinny players like Double G, Silas Schultz are in closer to that 1600 range. And uh, yeah, I don't know. It's so interesting getting this this uh, new data from the players. And I was like, huh, Calvin throws a little less spinny than I thought he did. That's, that's what I'm, I'm talking surprised. about. <laughs> I'm surprised because I feel like when I think of more spin, I think of a straighter flying disc for the most part, right? It's going to have less action at the end of its flight because it's not losing RPMs and wanting to fade as much. Mm-hmm. Um but I think of Calvin as like a very straight thrower. Laser beam. doesn't have a lot of action at the end of flights. So that surprises me that he wouldn't be up higher in the spin department. And I, I almost wonder, like, what would it look like if he did throw with more spin? It's interesting to consider. I, I think it's because the, the equipment he chooses would not fly laser beam straight for 99% of us. The eagles he throws are stiff and flat. The destroyers he throws are hilariously overstable for anyone who doesn't throw that fast. Um, Cole Rodolin actually said, those stats don't surprise me. He's like, I throw more in that 1400 range, but Calvin's throw is a lot more uh, just raw force. Like he has kind of that locked arm when he's throwing. So he's putting a ton of speed into the disc. But yeah, I, I don't think he has that same sling motion, that whippy motion that other guys do. Um, but he makes up for it by choosing the right stability of disc. But it's right. change nothing. <laughs> change yeah. absolutely nothing. Yeah, That's the beautiful thing think. about disc golf, right? Yeah. You know, what you get from more RPMs is slower turns. So you can throw those long, late flipping turnovers better. Um, and Calvin doesn't throw a lot of those. He's tried to because he's, you know, he, he lost the power forehand, but it's definitely not a shot he's, he's throwing that often. So that's the one thing you lose. But uh, I don't know. That, that stat was just kind of mind boggling to me. Uh, but we're going to get a lot more Super data like that. And it's going to be so cool to talk about that and compare and com- contrast as we get more data from the players. Got to get that into the broadcast, you know, like, oh, yeah. Stat cast stuff from MLB is so interesting. And, you know, going beyond just, miles per hour but also you know mm-hmm. of course in 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 baseball we're talking about launch angle and we're talking about yep. you know percentage chance of getting a hit and we're talking about you know the angle of attack and the spin rate on the ball and blah 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 like 
disc golf is even more mm-hmm. driven by those kinds of stats. And like there's less flukiness because, you know, it's like you hit the ball really hard. You hit it right to the shortstop. Uh-huh. Unlucky you. Um, but in disc golf, you know, for the most part, you're throwing it where you want to throw it, right? It's not like randomly spitting out of your hand. Uh, of course, there's still, if you're throwing to a gap 400 feet away, sure, there's randomness there. But the the angle of the disc, the angle of attack to the ground, I mean, all these stats, like it's fascinating stuff. Mm-hmm. And we have to figure out how can we get that stuff in real time without having to use some sort of modified disc. That's the holy grail. I don't know when that's coming, but that'd know. be wild to actually want to spend millions of dollars. Yeah. We could do it today. <laughs> Chip, like chips embedded into the, the discs yeah. to where they can throw them in yeah. competition. Uh, I think this is just the beginning. The, the guys or, at Texas ca- camera systems that can just see in super slow-mo, like what's going on. I mean, it's, yeah. it, it's definitely possible. It's just right now too expensive. Oh man, I think this is such a cool start though. And the guys at Tech Disc have so many big ideas for the future. And uh, I don't know, it's just uh, another part of the game that I've always wanted. And now here we are uh, being able to talk about that. So I have a few ideas. Like I, I want to do a little Mythbusters series with it too, to see like, oh, how much spin does a power grip actually give you? Or how much nose angle does it give you compared to a fan grip? And I, I know stories of players saying, hey, I just started power gripping like recently. So then you get, you know, I'd love to get the staff to see what's actually uh, mm-hmm. changing when players do that. So yeah, I don't know. That's, that's what I'm thinking about, Charlie. <laughs> we've, we've talked enough disc golf here, but just talking about throwing is uh, interesting to me. Great, great stuff, Brian. Always great to have you on the show. Thanks so much. <laughs> no and uh, I know uh, that you're getting married next week. So yes, sir. Uh, a, a pre congratulations to you. I hope the wedding goes fantastic. Thank you, sir. Yeah, it's always a it's always a fun time to come here and talk disc. And yeah, I will see you all at the Beaver State Fling. See you on Tournament Central. All right. Well, and uh, enjoy McIver. I hope the weather stays beautiful. And uh, Brian, I'll see you soon. All right, brother. Talk to you soon, my friend. That's going to do it for this edition of the Upshot. Thanks so much for being with us. Be back with you Thursday to preview Beaver State Fling right here on the Upshot.